everyone. This is Ron Visconti, and uh, I'm with Phase Two Careers. And in a moment, we're going to have uh, Corey speak about resumes for change or career change. And he's always filled with lots of information. He's just the job search guru, and he's a great guy. So we're going to learn a lot from him in the next hour plus. Um, just to tell you, if you're new to phase two, we've been around since 2010. We do several things, all kinds of job search webinars. Uh, we also do all kinds of career talks, uh, networking, recruiting. And of course, we have a very large section that does small business activities. To tell you a little bit about Corey, you've given how many talks now for us, Corey? Uh, maybe four or five. Yeah, yeah, you're you're gonna get your million dollar miles here coming, <laughs> coming up soon. But he's a Fortune 100 recruiter and a career coach, and he has his own business called CareerShakers.com. He helps corporate professionals find their jobs, uh, find their next jobs. He does workshops, technology events, a lot of radio. Uh, does has a YouTube channel. Does weekly career content. Um, so he posts to entrepreneurs and people changing careers. And he went to a great college. I, I'm fond of Santa Clara University, and he graduated summa cum laude. So uh, you got to show a little respect to a, a Santa Clara grad. So I'm going to hand it over to you uh, there, Corey. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. We are going to have a super intimate session tonight, which actually I don't mind because then we can really answer all of your questions. Hopefully you're in the right place. Uh, we are going to learn how to write your resume or update your resume when you're doing a career switch. I have heard that there are a few other webinars and other events going on tonight. So thank you, everyone, for making the time. I, I, my goal is to make this as valuable for you as possible. And if you're not in the right place, I encourage you to stay. I promise you'll still learn something either way. Just by a quick show of hands, I think there's like a raise hand button in Zoom. Who here is like actually looking to change their careers right now? One, two, mm. just two of you, huh? Wow, all right. So either everyone here is just learning some information for the future, or maybe we can inspire a few folks who are thinking about changing careers here tonight. So just to give you some background on me, in, in addition to whatever Ron has already said, so I myself have changed careers twice. I've changed once in internally within my, my previous employer, and then I did a total 180 career switch, and I moved from management consulting to do recruiting. And so after I did that, I actually kind of fell into this as like a side side passion project of mine, where other folks from my previous jobs were asking me how I was able to change careers, get a job without any experience, work for a Fortune 500 company right off the bat, how I was able to do all of that. And then I ended up coaching people for the last four years about how to do career switches, most of the time without having to go back to school. So <clears throat> I think one of the one of the main reasons I wanted to cover this topic with with Ron and we had brainstormed a few other ideas about what to cover. Um, I've I've talked about interview prep and a bunch of other stuff already here in the group. I think I did one on networking too. But when it comes time to writing your your resume, when you when you want to do a career switch, there's a lot of information out there, right? I just did a quick. Google search, if you just type in best resume for career change, you're going to see a bunch of sponsored ads at the top. You're going to see a bunch of recommended, uh, a bunch of recommended links here. And if you click on each of these, the interesting thing is they will each give you different recommendations and different resumes to use for a career change. And so I just thought it would be so helpful for folks to kind of know what I recommend to all of my clients so that you can pick and choose what, what you feel is going to be helpful for you. And then you can decide what formatting or what, what resume ultimately you, you want to use. So hopefully after tonight, I can clear up some of this confusion and give y'all some, some, some recommendations that I know have worked for me and for my clients. So specifically, what, what we're going to cover is I'm going to explain what I believe the best resume format or formats are to, to use for a career switch. Then once you know what those resume formats are, I'm going to tell you how to then update your resume. And we're going to have 
a quick live session and brave volunteer for, for, the, for, for that, hopefully. And then I'm going to talk about some common mistakes that I see some people making when you are trying to do a career switch, because it can be a bit tricky depending on what kind of career change you're trying to make. So I, I just wanted to cover those three topics. If there's anything that you want me to cover that I am not going to cover in this, feel free to come off mute or put a question in the chat. I just want to make this as valuable for all of you as possible. It should be about 40-ish minutes of content, and then the rest of the time will be Q&A. And I will make sure that Ron gets a copy of this in case everybody wants um, these notes and stuff for, for mm. later. Resume formatting. This, I think, is you know the, the foundation for everyone's resume, trying to understand what is the best. When you do that Google search, they're going to recommend quite a few different things. And... In terms of what I believe is the best resume formatting to use, let's start with a quick, quick exercise and poll here. So on the left, I have the functional resume, and I'll explain what that means in a second. And on the right side, I have your traditional or chronological resume. So uh, a functional resume is one that, as you can see here, focuses more on the skills that you have, aka functions, within your career. So you can see in this example, they don't even list what company that they work at or what their job title is. Instead, they talk about their accomplishments and they've categorized their accomplishments or their skills into different sections or buckets, right? Like educational, phlebotomy, compliance, et cetera. So they're trying to show that, hey, I've got phlebotomy experience, I've got compliance experience, I've got program management and supervision experience, et cetera. So this is what's known as a functional resume, focusing more on like your functional skills. And then on the right, you have your traditional chronological resume where, you know, it's summary followed by work experience, chronologically ordered, job titles, bullets, accomplishments, etc. So between the two, what do you think or which format do you think is better to use for a career switch? Probably mm -hmm. functional. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And if you do a Google search, actually, they will all, almost all of them will recommend a functional resume. Hmm. What do you think is a disadvantage of the functional resume? It doesn't show where you worked, when you were, what jobs you had. Why would that be important, Sherry? Well, they want to know your experience, your actual experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But what, what about the traditional resume? Why wouldn't the traditional resume be good for a career switch? You can see exactly where you worked. You can see their job titles. It talks about their accomplishments. Mm -hmm. I can't see it that well, but it looks like the functional one, the person is aiming to become a phlebotomist. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't see what Bruce Bennett was on his, um, on his chronological resume. Yeah, oh. the... the, the person, the hiring person has to do too much work with the traditional resume to find um, the skills. Mm -hmm. If they're looking for a position that's essentially identical to what they just had, then it's easy. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if it's different, then you, you can't see what the skills, the transferable skills really are. Exactly. Yep. Yep. So as, as you can tell already in this short discussion, there's pros and cons of each of these different resumes. The functional resume is great because it highlights your transferable skills, which is good for a career switch. The downside though is I have no idea how recent these skills are. I don't know where you get these skills from, right? According to, to this resume, they, they know phlebotomy compliance, program management and technology. I don't know like how recent they've they've done these technology implementations or skills, right? I don't know where their program management stuff is coming from. So that's one of the disadvantages of it. And then as you guys already mentioned about the, the traditional is if you're applying for the exact same job you have, it's probably perfect. But when you want a different type of job, you're kind of branding yourself the wrong way. And so the overall format that I like, there's, there's basically two of them, uh, but they're both considered a hybrid resumes. So what a hybrid resume do, basically does is it combines both of these together. And I'll show you two examples that I actually used. So this first one here is one I used uh, when I was trying to actually get into recruiting for my management consulting job. And this is how I actually ended up getting hired 
was I used this version. Um, and I don't recommend it for everybody for a few reasons, but let me explain about what this hybrid resume does. So at the top, you can see, I don't have a summary section. I just would have my name and then this is like my education. And then this is my work experience here. Now, each of my roles have a summary, basically paragraph here, where I try to highlight my transferable skills in paragraph form basically explaining how this job was somehow related to being a recruiter or becoming a recruiter. And then I have my achievements here at the bottom like you would for a standard resume. Now, the advantage here is that because I have these summary sections, if someone takes the time to read it, I am explaining basically how this specific role is relevant for what they're looking for in the next position. The disadvantage, though, is that not a lot of people like to read essays. And so if they see these paragraphs, they may not take the time to read it. And because I have these achievements down here at the bottom, and everybody likes looking at bullet points anyways, they're only pretty much going to read the bullet points, which is also fine because I've ordered them in a way that shows my transferable skill set. It basically reiterates exactly what I talked about at the top. So this is a high, this is what I consider to be a hybrid resume because it's still chronological. I didn't move anything around. This is still the order of the jobs in which I had. So they can see exactly what jobs provided me certain skills or gave me certain experiences that may be relevant for what they're looking for. But I'm also using the, the space here to talk about how my experience is trans transferable. Mm -hmm. So this is one version of a hybrid resume that folks could could, could play around with. It, it worked for me. It, it, it may not work if you have a lot of experience because then you would have to have a lot of these paragraphs. Um, and you know, it, it is a lot of writing. And then to update these when you're applying for, for different jobs, it, it can be pretty labor intensive. But some people do prefer this because it allows you to kind of explain each of your experiences. So this is one version of the hybrid resume. And then the second one um, is one that I used for a fun exercise, actually, when I uh, wanted to see if I could get hired in a sales role, just, just to see like how good my uh, resume writing skills were for a career switch. So that's where this one comes from. But this one is another hybrid resume because it's still chronological. So people know exactly what I'm doing, what my job titles are, where I'm working, where I'm getting my experience. But I actually use clever formatting here to really showcase my transferable skills. So you can see that I use bold to highlight either major accomplishments and or transferable skills or experiences that would match a sales position. So I bolded, right, um, I, I achieved 170% of quota, um, designed and delivered prospecting and closing trainings, both of which are sales buzzwords, which I bolded to match the job description of what they're looking for, right? Generating new leads, that one, that one automatically stands out to people, right? So by a quick glance, if you just looked through my resume very, very quickly, you could see that there's certain things that will catch your eye that will make you realize that I have transferable skills without having you know, to read long paragraphs like I have in the first version. Um, this, this type of hybrid resume is good for folks who've been working a little bit longer, um, or if you actually have a lot of these transferable skills that will match over to the job description. The first version, I think I can go back here. Yeah, this first version is actually also a little bit better for folks who don't have as much transferable or directly relevant experience. And this, this kind of helps you in a way like mask it a bit because you can talk over it and give it this narrative with these paragraphs and these explanations versus with this one, there's no narrative that I can give because I'm relying on my experience and skill set to pop out on its own using the formatting. And then another version of this like hybrid resume number two is at the beginning of these bullets, you can actually write out like an experience or a skill set that they're looking for and then put like a, like a colon and then put these bullets here to show them that you actually have that. So for example, I could have put like, um, as a recruiter for Google, you know, I have, I've, I have prospecting and closing experience. So, so I would write prospecting and closing colon, and then I would put this example, right? Designed and delivered prospecting and closing trainings for 25 plus recruiters, right? Um, sales, I, I would put like sales experience colon, facilitated event marketing campaign to generate new leads, 
in increase diversity hiring, et cetera, et cetera. All right, any questions about these two versions of the resume and like why, why I think they're good for career switches? So this one is somewhat like a chronological, but instead of just saying what you did, you are uh, focusing on your accomplishments, it seems. Mm -hmm. Yep, but I'm using the formatting here to draw the reader's attention to the transferable skills that would overlap between both roles. So in this case, I wanted to see if I could become a, a, a someone in sales, like a transition to a sales role using my recruiting experience. Oh. Now, bec because there is an overlap between both of those jobs, both of them mm -hmm. involve selling, they're, they're selling different things, but the sales process is pretty similar t t to the recruiting process in terms of like sourcing, prospecting, and then negotiating, closing. There, there's a lot of overlap there. So that's why mm -hmm. this version of the resume works out well. Okay. And then you can further enhance it by actually like writing certain skills at the beginning of each bullet to really drive home the point. But on your other resume, it said you worked at Santa Clara University. Why? Where is that on here? Oh, it's it's not on here. So oh. this one, um, I put that I was a campus recruiter for Santa Clara while I was at my my previous employer. Oh. Because that that's what that's when I was trying to move from management consulting to recruiting. And I had done campus recruiting for my firm at the, at the time. Um, but now that I'm a act like a full, full fledged recruiter, um, I didn't put my campus recruiting experience on here because it's not relevant for sales. Okay. Yeah. Instead, I wanted to talk about my sales strategy and operations consulting experience where I was consulting like SVPs of sales on like the, their sales strategy, deal structure, pricing analysis, product analysis, et cetera. So I, I, I kind of picked and, choo and chose what skills to highlight and what experiences and jobs I had, mm -hmm. which we're gonna talk about also later on in this uh, webinar. Okay. Cool, any questions so far about resume formatting? So now that you know what potential resume formats to utilize, pros and cons of each, and I've seen people get jobs, honestly, with functional resumes, with, with chronological resumes, with hybrid resumes. You can use whichever one you, you prefer. There are, there are pros and cons to all of them. I think the hybrid resume has the, the least amount of cons. But now that you know which one you're going to be using, how do you actually update or change or create this career change resume? Like, what do you need to actually update and, and edit? Well, one of the first things, and I, I honestly believe everyone doing a career switch, it's mandatory you need to have a summary section. There's no doubt about it. I think you absolutely need to have a summary section. Why? Because you need to explain to the recruiter or the hiring manager why you're qualified for this role when you don't necessarily match the job title, right? Because if you just apply for, a, for let, let's say I applied for a sales role as a recruiter, when the recruiter opens up my application, they're gonna see Corey is a recruiter. This is a sales position, reject. He's clearly applying for the wrong role. But if they read my summary statement, which I wrote here, and I bolded at the top, hopefully to catch their attention, they'll see, wait, Corey's a recruiter. He applied for a sales role. I'm going to reject him. Oh, wait, top ranked recruiter looking to become a sales development representative. Oh, okay. So he didn't apply for the wrong job. He did this on purpose. Interesting. Uh, let me read, right? I don't know. I think recruiters could 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 be qualified for my role, but I don't know. Let me read. Seeking to leverage my prior sales management and consulting and recruiting experience to transition into a sales development role. So here, I have already addressed the elephant in the room that says, basically, look, I don't have any sales experience, but I do think my experience is transferable. And I'm going to tell you exactly what experience I think is transferable. This is important because if you're applying for a total different job, you, you already have to address the fact that you don't have the same job title, right? So right off the bat, I've addressed that and I've said, hey, I'm going to explain to you in these next few sentences why I'm actually qualified for this. Then I say my transferable experience, it, you know, d designing sales structures, blah, 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 right? I use a bunch of sales buzz terms 
I called out all of my relevant experience and or skills that I have that would transfer over to a sales role. And I'm saying, hey, look, if you don't read any further, you can just see here that I do have some exposure to sales and I've done certain things like cold calling, carrying a quota, generating leads, handling rejection, et cetera, that you know, makes me qualified for this role, even though I am a recruiter. And then next, I wanted to show that I'm not just qualified, but I'm also a top employee. Like I'm a great employee to hire regardless of what I do. So I said, without any prior experience, I was able to become the top recruiter in my organization within six months and plan to bring the same coachability and resilience to your team. I, I don't like these soft, like soft skills, like coachability and resilience, but I wasn't sure how else to like finish out my sentence. So that's what I went with. If anyone has any other better ways to have wrapped that up, let me know. Um, but here, basically I'm saying, look, I've gotten jobs before where I didn't have prior experience and I've been very good at it. And then I think this is this part is actually going to be really, really key is I did a lot of research about the role that I wanted and I knew what's important for them. What are some key acronyms? What's the verbiage? What are some sales buzzwords that sales development representatives need to know? Right. And so I say I, I have also been trained to uncover budget, authority, need and timing, a.k.a. BANT, which is a very popular, common, basic sales term and how to expand a customer base through Zoom Info. So Zoom Info is basically their prospecting and leads database that all companies use. Um, Discover.org, same thing. LinkedIn Sales Navigator, that helps um, SDRs identify who their main points of contact are within each company. Basically, who are the decision makers that they need to be talking to to sell these, these products or close these deals and other prospecting tools. So here in this last sentence, I have shown that I've done an immense amount of research and I can talk the talk and walk the walk, right? I know, I know what BANT is, which means I've done the research. I'm taking this seriously. I, I actually want this job. And I know certain key terminology like BANT, Zoom Info, Discover.org, LinkedIn Sales Navigator, et cetera. And then here at the bottom are all of, all of, my, res all, all of my, my relevant skills. So it doesn't have to follow this exact format, but this is usually what I recommend for folks. You have to have some type of summary statement explaining how you may have different experience, but it is still relevant. And then giving them the confidence that, hey, you should at least get an interview. So I'm in sort of a weird situation in that um, I'm kind of trained in aspects of what I want to do. It's mm -hmm. not, um, but there, um, so I have, I have a rhetoric degree and we focus on the form rather than the content, um, which a lot of places don't understand how that's possible. So I sort of feel like instead of, um, explaining how my previous job was similar, I need to be higher level. Does that make sense? Um, I'm not Probably too sure. Explaining this, <laughs> which is my problem. Okay. Well, we can always dive deeper into that. Why don't we do this? I think this exercise may be helpful. So now that you all know how to, what goes into a good summary statement on your resume, I want you guys to take five minutes real quick and draft up what you think your summary statement would be. And I would love to get one volunteer to read it. With, with everyone. And then I'll, I'll give you feedback live on, on how to update that. And so I guess, R Rebecca, if you want, um, why don't you take a stab at it for five minutes and then I'll, I'll give you my feedback on what I think you can update or change. Okay. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Sherry. Yeah. Um, my dilemma is different. It's, um, I, I, would like to go back to a field I did 25 years ago. <laughs> mm, interesting. Yeah. And I've done different work. I retired recently, but I would like to go back to the field I was in 25 years ago. So that's a little tricky to explain. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I think depending on how you write your summary, it could, it could be pretty easy, honestly. 
the main thing you'll have to address is if your skills are still current and still relevant. Um, if you mm. use them 25 years ago, for example, right? That would be my concern if I was a recruiter. Um, but I think there's there's a lot of ways to to show that you still have current skills. You can talk about certain terminologies or certain new technologies that maybe have emerged since then, but you're still up to date with those things. You are going to also have to probably show, I guess, more recent experience, maybe volunteer work, maybe do some side projects where you can show that, that you've still got that, that skill set. But a good, strong summary statement can really help set, your, set yourself up for an interview. Rebecca, if you would be so kind and so brave, we'd love to hear your rough draft of your summary statement. And, and why don't you just give us all s some context? What is the job that you are trying to switch into? Okay, so I have sort of a couple of elements. One is that um, I have been mostly volunteering okay. over the last um, 18 years um, while I raised my kids. Mm -hmm. um, but I have um, a background, uh, I have a um, PhD in rhetoric and I've taught in rhetoric composition um, and history um, years ago and I published my own um, work and I worked in um, high tech PR um, as well. So, uh, but what I'd really like to do is um, actually part time work um, editing in um, science and medicine or developing technologies. Not like um, the problem is people keep sending me towards, oh, well, what about doing? Um, technical editing as in really specific um, documentation, but my skills are really in synthesizing complex material and presenting it to broader audiences. Um, and that's what I'd like to do, but they will look for a degree in the field instead of recognizing that I am trained to look at the information and make the information understandable even though I don't have a background in it. What is that job called? Um, I call it editing. Is there does anything else strike you? <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure what the formal job title is. I've never heard of a job like that. It sounds like a, like a technical writer or a... Uh, um... It's a technical writer, but not in the sense of like documentation. Um, but in the sense of, um, it's almost, uh, I'm gonna say it, it's almost sort of marketing editing in a technical sense. So like a company, a company has a brand new product that they wanna release. And then your job would be to edit the, edit the what? Okay, so for instance, um, my, dream job used to be when I lived in the East Bay was to work with um, Lawrence Livermore lab and go around to the different labs and say, okay, so tell me what you're working on. And then I would write it up and present it in a way that investors or incoming students or um, uh, uh, the general public press release, um, you know, a good a story in the newspaper or something would understand what it is. So couldn't that be in the corporate communications of of a company that's has, you know, has, you know, they're on the stock market and they want to have it known to their stockholders what they're all about. Okay. That yes, that's true. And okay. I, and then okay. I'm also thinking um, the product marketing managers of different life sciences companies or science, um, they're kind of go-betweens between the scientist and the business development. And so you're kind of a translator for them, right? Right. Okay, okay. Okay, yeah, All what right. did you say, so, go-between? I like that, go-between, between for the scientists and... Well, I have a friend, for example, who's in business development uh, for a life sciences company, 
what makes him interesting is he was a scientist and he also he so he could speak their language and right. he's also doing business development so you're trying to bridge bridge is a word i want to think of bridging the two worlds okay right okay so basically i guess to to summarize you're you're trying to re-enter the workforce um after kind of 18 years off of of raising a family and well, it's not being paid right I mean, it's not like i mean if, if mom's got paid time, to raise their own kids that'd be the awesome right? i was doing all the marketing material for the scout troop for the book fair for the robotics team right it's not like i wasn't working right was right right but team. kind of re-entering the full-time i guess workforce um after volunteering and, and raising a family and you're targeting like a co corporate communications role for example okay so let's let, let's hear your first draft of your resume summary well i didn't get complete sentences i just got sort of chunks of it that's okay um um skilled editor looking to explain complex medical and scientific material to general audiences um looking to bring my extensive experience in um synthesizing um technical information um with extensive background in research, writing, um, and editing. Um, okay. So, yeah, I got kind of stuck. Okay, so let me go back to mine here. So what you have is a good start and that's where I started basically, right? So what, you're, what, you, what it sounds like you have right now is a job description. Right. You're talking about what you would do in your job, synthesize information, um, make it consumable, et cetera, et cetera. Uh -huh. But that's a little bit different. Right. That's that's what the job is. What you need to show is that I have the skills, if that makes sense. Like there's a slight difference there. So, okay. for example, um, instead of saying that sales development representatives um, prospect, find leads, close deals, right, sell stuff. Instead, I'm saying I'm leveraging my prior experience doing sales work, and then I list specific things, right? Um, I used to design sales structures, implemented CRM technologies, carried a quota, did cold calling, generated leads, handled rejections, et cetera. So first, the first thing I say is, hey, look, I have this experience. I have the skills that you need. Here are the skills that you need that I have. Boom, 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 boom. It's different than saying, I know that sales development representatives need to know how to use a CRM, comma, carry a quota, comma, cold call, comma, generate leads, right? I didn't say that. Instead, I'm saying, hey, I know how to do these things. Then I say, okay, then I demonstrated that I'm a top performer, which you don't necessarily always have to do. But then I talk about, okay, I also have the skills for BANT, you know, how to expand a customer base, zoom info, discovery.org, et cetera, et cetera. So what you, I think what you should do for the second version of this is you need to kind of highlight your relevant skill set that says, or your, your prior experiences, like when you were um, uh, writing stuff for, for the, for the girls troop, um, for the sciences fairs, maybe what, maybe, maybe what your PhD was on, right? So instead of saying, Hey, this is what your job is. You say, Hey, I've got these skills, which basically says that 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 that's what the job is, and that's why my skill set is transferable. Or actually, in your in your case, it's not really a career switch because you've done it before, just just maybe a few years ago, right? So well, it's like a field. I guess it's a switch in in um, field. Yeah. Yeah, or industry. I guess is industry, but in but your primary skill set remains the same, which is your strength here. Right. And then the only part that you would then need to address is how it would transfer over from different industries or from different fields. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. But it's a really good start. And, and that's how I recommend everyone start, right? You just kind of write it out like it's a job description. And then from there, you, you kind of level it up one time by saying, okay, instead of saying you do X, Y, and Z as a corporate communications person, you say, I have this, I have done X, Y, and Z. That's why I'm qualified to be a corporate communications person. Okay, so I can explain that. Ex say that I explained um, complex cryptological techniques to a general public and things like Boom. that. 
right? Because that's like you showing that you have the skill set as opposed to saying you have it, right? Okay. Right. It's like, hey, I'm smart. How do I know you're smart? I'm smart. I just told you I'm smart. Versus, hey, I have I graduated summa cum laude. I had a 4.0 GPA. Right. No, nowhere in there did, did I use the word smart, but people would infer that I'm smart. Okay. All right. That helps. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. All right. So after you get your summary statement down, the next section is the skills section. Well, skills slash technologies, depending on the industry or job that you want. But I do think this is highly, highly recommended for anyone doing a career switch. You need to have some type of skills or technology section. Here is where you're going to drive home the point, because if they don't read the summary, because it's a lot of words, people may not read it. At least here, they can see what are the hard skills that you have that match up perfectly to their job description and what they want. Now, in this example, I just pulled it from Google. They have these three columns. I don't recommend you, you do that. Try just keep it to two columns um, because normally these three columns mean that you have like a, like a weird formatting thing. It's basically a table. In order to, in, in order to create something with three, with three columns, you have to use a table. And for certain ATS systems, they, they can't read these tables. So I usually just, just recommend you either keep it as bullets or you kind of um, just have like two columns at most. But here, you want to focus on all of the hard skills that transfer over. No soft skills. So no soft skills. Now, a soft skill is saying like, my skill is that I'm hardworking or that I'm intelligent or that I'm resilient or that I work under pressure, right? That is a soft skill. Soft skills do not go in a skill section. That is not going to get you hired, especially when you're doing a career switch. So these need to be hard skills only that map or, or technologies, right? Like if you're applying to be some type of engineer or in your case, Rebecca, maybe you're applying for something very technical or in a new field, you may need to know certain technologies or certain drugs or certain scientific methods, whatever, right? Maybe certain scientific systems that they use or tools that they use to like document everything. I don't know, but it can be tools or skills that need to go in this section. Now, a common question that I get all the time is, well, Corey, what if I don't have a lot of skills to put here? Well, that is actually a good thing because this should be a really good learning and teachable moment for you. Because if you don't have a lot of the skills that are required to get this job, unfortunately, it just means that you're not qualified yet. But it doesn't mean you'll never be qualified. Doing this exercise also shows you, okay, what are some of the skills that I need to go and get either through online learnings, through certification courses, through volunteer work, through, you know, maybe, maybe you're going to take a class, maybe you get a mentor, maybe you do something just so you can put this back on your resume. And if it's something like a technology that you need to know how to use, there's a lot of these free courses on Coursera where you can get these certifications, you can like play around with stuff and demos. So there's, there's a lot of quick ways to build up this, quill, this skills section. Next, once you do those two things, now we're gonna talk about the job titles and the bullets. And, and the job title is actually gonna be the biggest thing that will make a big difference for you and helps with the like resume ATS optimization. The first thing I want to talk about is job titling. Very, very important. Job, job titling. So where possible, if possible, without lying, it's best to match up your job title to as close to the role that you are applying to, assuming you have the experience and the skill set. Now, sometimes or actually I would say most of the time, everyone's natural instinct is to take the job title that they were given when they applied for their position and put it on their resume verbatim. That's what most people do, right? Well, Corey, I was hired as a financial analyst. So I'm going to put financial analyst down on my resume because that's my job title, which is true. It's 100% true. But there are times where your job title doesn't always perfectly match with the skills or with the, or with the job that you're actually doing. So for example, I was coaching someone whose formal job title was as a product manager. But as I learned about what they did day to day in their job, they were actually working a lot with their corporate partners and some of their large key accounts. 
their job was to gather feedback from these partners and, and, and major accounts about the product and to understand what certain features they either liked or don't like or certain bugs or what, what is not going, what, what, what they don't like about the product. And then their job was to relay that information over to the engineering team and the product manager who actually owns the product to implement and create these new features. And then their job was basically to answer questions and to manage these key accounts and partnerships. So even though on paper, their job was as a product manager, if you think, if you looked at their responsibilities, they were actually in like a corporate partnership role or like an account manager role or like a sales role, kind of like product marketing maybe. So even though the job title that they were given said product manager, they were in fact wearing a few different hats and this can easily happen also because if you've been at a company for a while, maybe you do wear multiple hats, right? Maybe you do have multiple responsibilities. Maybe you were hired as a front office desk person, but you also handle payroll, or maybe you also help with recruiting from time to time, right? Or maybe you help the operations team and logistics team. Maybe you help the facilities team um, when they buy new office spaces, right? You help them set up certain things or you help organize the, the move. So even though you may have a specific job title, sometimes you have roles or responsibilities that may bleed over into the job that you want to have. So where possible without lying, I would encourage folks to be a little bit creative with their job titles. I had a friend um, who I was coaching who was a finance analyst and they wanted to get into marketing. And so I said, well, I think the first thing we should do without going back to school is I think you should become the financial analyst for the marketing team. So you can get some exposure, build some connections, and then now your resume is going to be a little bit more marketing focused. So on paper, their job title was finance analyst. But on the resume, when they're applying for these marketing roles, I wanted them to write marketing finance analyst. So now when they do a quick look at your resume, oh, marketing finance analyst. Let me read a little bit more. And then in their responsibilities, I told them to get more involved on the program management side. You still have to do your day-to-day your, your -day job as a financial analyst, but if you can get more involved on some certain programs, and then you can work more on marketing reports, right? Talk about key marketing KPIs, et cetera, et cetera. And then they built up their resume so that they could transfer over into a marketing program manager role. So those are just a couple examples of, of being a little bit more creative and targeted with your job titles where possible. Now, for some of you, that may not be possible. If it's a total 360, 180 career switch, zero re relevant skills or, or, or relevant experiences, I understand. That's where the summary statement comes in to, to help you with that. Now for the bullets, for the bullets. Normally in a traditional resume, you would order your bullets based on impact or like um, importance, basically. So normally in a chronological resume, I tell everybody your most impactful, your most impressive bullet or, or achievement or accomplishment goes at the top. However, if you're doing a career switch, the one that goes at the top needs to be the most relevant or transferable skill that you have or accomplishment that is, that is related to this new position that you want. So the order of your bullets is now going to matter. You're going to want to change it up a little bit. And then as we discussed with the whole hybrid resume thing, get a, get a little bit creative with the, with the formatting, call out the transferable skills or experiences that you have that bleed over between both of the different roles. Sherry, because you're the only one on video, I like, I like constantly keep looking at your face for like validation <laughs> that like it makes sense or like sometimes yeah. I see I see you nod your head and I'm like, okay, sh 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 okay, I, I explained it well. Sh she gets it. She gets it. Yeah, no question. Now, um, when you are applying for jobs, I can tell you that the biggest difference that it's going to make about you getting interviews and getting calls back comes down to your job titles. Hmm. I can speak from pure experience that it's when you play with the job titles, you will notice either an increase or a decrease in the amount of responses that you get when you're applying for these jobs. And again, I don't want you to lie, but in some of those examples I've given you, there are many instances where your job title doesn't always 100% match what you actually do, which allows you that flexibility and creativity to modify your job title a little bit. Now, I think just because we started a little bit late, 
I'll come back to this if we have time for, for someone to, to work on this, but I wanna get through this last section here and then open it up for Q&A. So common mistakes that I see when people are changing careers and trying to update their resume. So the first one, the first big one is using the same resume to apply for everything. I know it's hard, it's a lot of work, you have to create different versions, it's annoying, takes time, I totally get it, I understand. But it's much better to apply for one or two specific roles that you have a customized, tailored, perfect resume to, to get a better response rate than to spend the time applying for a bunch of random different roles with the same resume with a low probability of getting called back. And yes, you do need to create a different resume for each type of job, right? There are different types of marketing jobs. So, not, so you can't just have a marketing resume, right? There's different types of marketing jobs. You can't just have a, a finance resume because there's different types of finance jobs. You can't just have an accounting resume, right? You need to make sure that you have a different version for each of the specific jobs that you want. That means your bullets gotta be moved around. Maybe you need to change the summary statement. Maybe you need to change the job titles a little bit, right? Maybe you're applying for a senior accountant role and you wanna put senior accountant as opposed to accountant or accounting analyst. If you're applying for, an for, an for, an for a more an analytical role, right? Or if you're applying, or maybe very commonly uh, data, data analysts, right? You can put data analyst or you could put sales analyst. You can put business analyst. You can put operations analyst. You can put supply chain analyst, right? Depending on the job that you want, I think you should take the time to customize your resume and your job titles and your bullets so that when you apply the ATS system, it flags you and puts you at the top of the pile. Hey, Corey, um Maybe it's not the appropriate spot right now, but a lot of our people have, of course, more than 10 years of experience. Do you want to impart any tips for incorporating some meaty stuff that goes beyond 10 years? Yeah, so it's going to be dependent on each person's situation, but let's say you are applying for the same type of job that you already have, not a career switch. Assuming all of your experience has been in the same field, I think if you have more than 10 years, maybe two pages, if, if all the older stuff is truly, truly relevant and impactful, okay, two pages. I'll, I'll, otherwise, I feel like you can get away with one page. For those who have less than 10 years of experience, no matter what, I think one page is all you need for sure. You don't need two pages, career switch or not. Now, let's say you are doing a career switch one page is usually what I recommend. If it's like a really drastic career change, it's probably one page. Because having two pages of unfortunately irrelevant job experience for a job that you want is not really going to help your case. And when you are switching careers, if you do, even if you do have a lot of experience, you're going to want to pick and choose which experiences or which job titles you want to you want to use to highlight your transferable skills anyways. And so it's probably not going to be two pages. Okay, thank you. But you know, it's it's case dependent. It it it, it can fluctuate, but that's my general consensus. Good question though, Ron. Thanks. All right. Now, number 2 I think is really important and this one really helped me. And that's Asking for feedback and listening to the market. I think a lot of people just focus on, okay, I got to apply for this job. Okay, I'm doing this interview. Oh, it didn't go well. Okay, uh, I'm so embarrassed. I, got, I have to get off this phone call. Oh, uh, yeah, all right. They're, they're not interested. You know, whatever. I screwed up this interview. Like, just get me off this phone already. Uh, you know, I just applied for 100 jobs this week. No one called me back. Like, I better apply for another 100 jobs. Yeah. Listen, listen to the market, right? ask for feedback where possible. That was really big for me when I was networking and when I was even interviewing, when I was trying to change careers and become a recruiter, I would just ask them like, Hey, thanks so much for speaking with me. You know, um, I, I know that I don't match the typical profile. Like what, what made you want to speak with me? Oh, okay. That that's interesting. Or if the interview doesn't go well, Hey, you know, it sounds like I'm not a fit. I get that. There's some skills that I don't have that, that, that are required. Where do you think I could get these skills? Like, is there 
is there a certain companies that you hire for? Are there other recruiting jobs that you feel like would be easier for me to get without experience? Oh, okay. Interesting. Cool, cool, cool. And then listening to the market, right? Like if you're applying for a hundred jobs a week and you're not getting called back, either the resume is not in a good shape or unfortunately you don't have the skills yet to make this career switch, which is okay, which is okay. Sometimes you have to take uh, intermediary job to get you some skills to get you to your ultimate dream job where you want to be. And that's okay. For me, one of the biggest things was I originally wanted to be an executive coach. That was my dream job when I wanted to quit management consulting was becoming an executive coach. And so I was networking with a bunch. Everyone would told me, Corey, you know, most executive coaches, they're like twice your age. And they're all former executives. And so executives go to retired executives to ask them how they became executives and how they became so successful. And then these executives will coach other executives. So not many executives would it be interested in hiring a 25-year-old executive coach that's not an executive, unfortunately. I said, okay, that makes a lot of sense. You know, That was me asking for feedback, listening to the market. That makes sense. So I said, well, you know, I, I, that, that's my dream job because – I want to help people, individuals, and I, I want to help people that have a really big impact in a company. And they said, well, you know, what's very similar to executive coaching is executive recruiting because these executives, when they're looking for new jobs, they will ask you for advice. Like, should I take this job? Should I take this job? Which one's better for my career? You know, like, you know, what, what about this company? Have you heard about this company? And I said, oh, that's interesting. I never thought about recruiting as a job. And I never thought about recruiting or recruiters as coaches, but you're right. You probably do get to kind of coach people. So that's how I ultimately found my, my, my dream job now was I asked for feedback. I listened to the market. The market said, I'm not qualified. <laughs> no matter what I did, no matter how great I wrote my resume, there was nothing I could do. Market said I was not qualified. So I asked for feedback and then I discovered this, this new career that I absolutely love. All right, third mistake, poor, or I would say improper formatting of the resume. We already covered you know, the general format. I recommend the hybrid resume, but avoid these pictures, guys and girls, no pictures. Don't use those skill graphs that you see on Google, right? With like that, with that, with that little bar chart, right? That says like, um, you know, see coding three stars out of five stars, you know, or four stars out of five stars. Don't use any of that stuff. Um, re recruiters hate that. Um, Ron kind of talked about this earlier, but having a resume that's too long when it's not needed or too short, make sure you, you can utilize the full page. At least get one solid page uh, of information. Don't, don't do like those one and a half page resumes. Like pick, pick one page, pick two page. You don't want formatting to be a dumb reason as to why you don't get an opportunity to, to interview, especially when you're doing a career switch. When you're doing a career switch, you can't take any risks of getting rejected for for, for reasons out of for, for reasons that are within your control. Now, this this fourth one here comes comes with time and research about the role, but a big mistake is not using enough role specific terminology. So if you go back to my summary example here, I use a lot of role specific terminology, right? Bant, Zoom info, discover.org, LinkedIn sales navigator, prospecting tools, right? CRM, quota, generating leads. These are all sales industry specific terms that I've used throughout the resume, including the summary that shows A, I've done the research and B, I have these skills, right? Obviously I don't have, I don't have um, like at my job, it's not called generating leads. It's called sourcing on LinkedIn, <laughs> right? Like that's, that's, that's what my real job is. But when I'm changing or trying to become someone in sales, that same action is now called generating leads. So instead of on my resume writing, I source with LinkedIn, I say, I know how to generate leads. Does that make sense mm -hmm. to, to everybody? So it's, it's these slight tweaks, which will help your resume, of course, but these will all bleed over into your, into your interviews, which is going to be really important because you got to walk the walk. You got to talk the talk. The last one, 
Um, irrelevant bullets and achievements. Now, this one kind of also leads to what Ron was talking about earlier, right? If I've got 20 years of experience, like how long should my resume be? Oh, tw you know, it's probably got to be two pages because Corey said if you have more than 10 years, it's got to be two pages. So I better put a two-page resume together. But when you're doing a career switch, things are different now. When you're switching careers, you need to show that you're qualified and you have relevant transferable skills. And so if you're putting stuff on the resume just to fill two pages or just to get to one page, but it's not relevant to the job, then it's not helping you when you're doing a career switch. It's better to have less but more relevant than more stuff that's irrelevant. And again, the common question I'm going to get is, well, Corey, if, I'm, if I only put the relevant stuff, my resume is too short. That's okay. What does that tell you? That tells you that maybe you're not quite ready for this job yet, but maybe you can go get some experience quickly. And then now you'll have more stuff to put on the resume. So now your, your resume isn't too short. And sometimes it is a tough pill to swallow in the beginning because you found your dream job or you think you know what your dream job is. And now you're working on your resume. You're so excited. And then as you write down all the stuff that's relevant, you're like, wait, I don't even have half a page here. It can be, it can be really disappointing sometimes, but honestly, it's okay because you, you don't want to waste 5, 10, 20 hours applying for jobs that you're probably not going to get. Instead, take that 5, 10, 20 hours, go out, get some skills and experience that you can then put on the resume so now you can get these interviews. Because everyone came here tonight – just wanted to give a quick free bonus, free bonus tip. I don't know if it's relevant for everyone, but this is my little cheat sheet that I like to give people. These are jobs that I feel like are easily attainable, have low barriers to entry. You can do them either for free or even get paid sometimes, but these are really great jobs with low barriers to entry that you can get relevant, tangible work experience when you are trying to change careers. And I've categorized it for folks. So if you're trying to get into sales, I recommend, you know, possibly getting these types of jobs if you want to get into marketing, finance, et cetera. So this is my little cheat sheet, my thank you to everybody coming out. I don't know if you guys are interested in these general fields, but if you are, I think these are great ways to, to beef up the resume, paid or unpaid. So what is MLM? Multi-level marketing. So that's like a, that's like an Amway. That's like a um, Melaleuca. That's like a Cutco. Um, Got it. Yeah. You know, uh, Corey, I wanted just to make an observation and just to just get your feedback on that. Um, I see the market being more fluid with millennials and Generation Z, um, that they're moving more, more frequently and more savvy about moving. Um, any observations of that? For, for example, my son's 35 and he's made four career switches and fairly effortlessly, whereas I see more of a, more of a struggle with older workers. What, why do you, what's your observation about that? As to why I think it's easier for millennials or Gen Z to, yeah. to change careers? I think, well, one of it is, is there's less age bias. Fortunately or unfortunately, there's there's just less age bias. Um, now, there's clever things you can do with your resume to avoid age biases. Um, but I think that's that's typically one barrier is why would I invest the time to, to retrain someone who I know is going to be retiring pretty soon versus I can train Ron's son, who's 35. Uh, I invest a couple of years to train him. And then he's still got another 30 years to work, right? Um, that could possibly be, be one thing. Also, the, the technology moves so fast these days. And some people, regardless of age, are either good or bad at keeping up with all these new tech technologies, trends, and changes. So um, that, that, that could be one thing. I mean, there, there are people my age who pick up new technologies, new things super, super quick. There are also people my age who, like, don't know how to turn on the television. Right. So um, I don't think that one's necessarily age dependent, but I do think it, it is a little bit harder for the older, older folks um, to kind of pick up things 
uh, a little bit differently. And also, I think a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of roles or skills are what I would say like complementary or supplementary to each other these days. So, for example, like if you learn one specific skill in marketing it can translate over into certain skills in sales or certain jobs in sales, right? So even though you may have started in marketing, maybe depending on your interest or where your projects take you, you may end up being qualified for a sales role, or you may end up somehow being qualified for a product role, or you may end up being qualified for something else that you never really thought of. Because certain, certain skills, markets, industries like startups, you wear multiple hats, sometimes because younger folks are more open to taking riskier career moves, right? And we're open to changing jobs a little bit faster. That could also be why um, career changes tend to happen just more naturally as opposed to like seeking it out, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think generationally it's different. So for example, the, um, what's the generation above me, Ron? Is it, I forgot. I gave a whole presentation on this oh, and I forgot why? about it. Generation Y? The ones that are older than me? Uh, oh, um, wouldn't that be Y? Um, I, think, I think so, right? Yeah. Anyways, but, um, but there is a, there's a cultural shift. So, for example, the generation above me, I forget, or like my parents, for example, how you were raised and how you were brought up is very different, right? You had to work through two, three economic depressions. And so job stability was so important for them, meaning... You don't want to take a risk. You don't want to go work for some startup that no one's ever heard of. You don't want to go work for the next Google because if it doesn't work out, you have no money, right? But us, us millennials, us Gen Z, we're much more risk averse. Uh, we've never had to work through a recession. We don't really know what it's like to, you know, be like f financially unstable. So we're more willing to work for these sexy companies or these startups where you just naturally wear more hats because you work more, you work all the time, you don't have the well-defined roles. And I think that also kind of leads into people getting different experiences, which either encourages them to, to switch or just naturally leads them into other jobs. All right. So yeah, this is just the time for Q&A. Lisa, Rebecca, fire away. I'm, I'm here to help. Thank you both for, for sticking it all the way through. So whatever questions you want me to answer, I'm, I'm here. Can I just double check that um, I... I have um, always believed that you don't have to explain what's volunteer, that is what you were paid for and what you weren't paid for. Is that still true? Um, I don't yeah, I don't think you need to explain it on the resume. I mean, but it'll probably be pretty evident, I think, what's what's volunteer and what's not. Do you have any questions, Lisa? We you've been silent. Um, do you have any burning questions? It seems like you, you're interested in nonprofit organizations. What's the yeah. issue that you're confronting in making that transition? I was just going to uh, um, write something in the chat. Actually, I was taking a lot of notes. So I was um, not being very verbal. Um, but I got a lot out of it. I mean... Uh, I knew about hybrid resumes. I like some of the ver verbiage that Corey used. And I use a transferable, um, put my transferable skills on both uh, functional and chronological and tried to do, I'm trying to do a hybrid. So I'm, for me, it's kind of uh, looking at my skills and trying to figure out what I'm interested because I can be picky. Um, mm. You know, retirement's good for me, uh, but I can do a lot of stuff, and I, I feel like I want to be able to be current, which is really more of why I took this than that I was looking for anything in particular. I like to stay current, and I'm always open to an offer I can't refuse, and I'm always open to looking at... Um, how I can be more marketable and more contemporary and just to be able to, to talk to pe different people um, about my interests and their interests and um, have a conversation and, you know, explore from there. So thanks a lot, Corey and Ron.
Well, um, thank you. And it seemed like you answered that, Corey, when you mentioned you wanted to be an executive coach and you got feedback and that led you to something else. So that seems to be the same process for you, Lisa, having these conversations, um, right? Right. Uh, and, you know, I, I always get something from whatever I attend. Uh, sometimes I'm just not able to put into words how I'm going to use something, but I like to, I guess, um, maybe be able to look at my own skills in a different way. Uh, mine are, I don't know if I would consider it softer skills, but you know, I'm a counselor and a social worker, so it, it, it's a little bit different. But I like to see how people are um, uh, I guess uh, representing themselves and their skills and a little bit more about uh, what employers are looking for and what skills are important and valuable but I find all this helpful and fascinating um, because I want to keep growing as a person and as a professional and you know, if I see something I like, I want to be able to apply for it. And so this was very helpful me, to me. But that brings up a good question. You bring up a good question, Lisa. And I wanted to bounce around you, Corey. You're, you're talking about resumes, but you're also um, a, you know, a coach and a helper. Um, some, some of our people come at two ends of the spectrum they think the whole world is their oyster. So they're, everything's possible. And then you get the people that are very pigeonholed. No, I'm only going to use these skills. What's your advice for that? Because I do see that quite often that people, they, they look at the World Wide web as, oh, I could do that. I could do that. And that's part of the problem of, 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 you know, targeting jobs. If you, think you have a skill for everything yeah uh, it's, a, it's a common problem that i run into with some of my um clients all the time uh which is like the over ambitious and and the uh and the and the under ambitious i guess of course the sweet spot is somewhere in the middle but that's why i have this thing as my number two bullet which is listening to, to the market and that usually is what i use for for most people um, to kind of help gauge, kind of put them in check with their level of confidence, either raise their level of confidence or potentially, you know, redirect their efforts towards specific types of jobs that would also scratch that itch, but also give them a good chance of, of getting hired for. So I think if you are willing and open to listening to the market and asking for feedback, whether you're on the too shy side or you're on the too ambitious side, if you listen to the market, you'll kind of understand, okay, I actually truly am qualified for this, but not for this right now. Or yeah, this, th these people keep calling me back, but these people never call me back. Why is that? Right. Or yeah, I'm getting interviews for this, but never passing, but I'm always getting to the final rounds for this one. Like, why is that? So I think if you can find that balance in the middle, um, either by talking to people or just by looking at what, what results you're getting, um, it's it's going to be very helpful for you. But and what I, I, I like, uh, Corey, was what I thought was helpful because I do believe in being open to feedback and asking for it is your verbiage of some of the ways that you asked for it makes it easy to ask for feedback. Sometimes we don't always know how to say it. Mm -hmm. And so we get flustered. But if we know that there's a way that we feel comfortable asking, I think, then it puts us in a position to be ready for, for that conver conversation when that comes up. And um, you made it very easy for us to do that. So thanks. What about the problem of having them say that you're overqualified? So that's really actually never a real reason for someone to get rejected is, is for being overqualified. It's basically saying that there's something that we didn't like about you, but we just can't tell you what it is. Um, that's generally what it comes down to. Um, 
and I mean, there are, I would say, very small cases in which you are overqualified, meaning like you're too senior for the level, aka you're asking for too much money and that's not in the budget for the role, or they ideally want to hire someone at this level, but based on what they can see, you are probably higher at this level. And so they, they just feel like they're like you truly are overqualified. But that's so rare. Like that true, true scenario is so rare because if you were genuinely that overqualified, they would have never had you do all those interviews, right? Like they would have told you that at the beginning on the very first call with the recruiter that, hey, Corey, you're great. But to be honest, I need someone with two years of experience. You've got like eight. Um, I think you'd be bored here. Or I don't think this is, you know, really something that you want. Or, hey, Corey, I'm going to be honest, right? Like, I'm looking to pay somebody this amount, right? Like, I'm not sure you, your resume says you're a director. Are you sure, like, you're interested here? So it's almost it's almost never that reason that you're overqualified. It's usually that there's something else. Yeah, I, I, I do appreciate that honesty in that, Corey, because I think that is the case. Yeah. But I mean, if it's like on the first phone call and then they're like, hey, Rebecca, thanks so much for applying. I think after hearing about what you do, I think you are a little overqualified. Then, yeah, that then that's probably le legitimately you're overqualified. But if you did like, you know, the full shebang of interviews and they're like, oh, so sorry, Rebecca, you're just overqualified. Then Leslie, that's he said that I was else. overqualified and he hired me anyway. <laughs> Any questions? Because really, you're talking about strategy. You're talking about the psychology. Um, this this touches many more points than just writing a resume. It's really thinking things very thoroughly through. Yeah, and I guess one other po one other point that, that I want to make um, is a lot of people get very fixated when they find or hear about their dream job, and it's very 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 common, right? Um, like. Hey, Corey, you're great with people. I heard this all the time. Corey, you're great with people. You're such a good talker. You're so social. Like you're really extroverted. You know, you'd be so good as blank. And then like for most people, when you hear that, you're like, oh my God, you're right. I would be so good at that. Like that's the job that I want. And that is the only job that I want. And so for the next six months, I'm just going to write my resume. I'm just going to network with people. And I'm going to apply for jobs that are only this job, no matter what, because I love that job so much. And sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't work out. And I think that's when you listen to the market, but also you got to realize when you're doing a career switch, not everybody gets to make that perfect dream job jump right away. And that's something that from a mindset perspective is helpful for people to understand is your career is long. And so to take a job that maybe gives you some additional experience so that you're now qualified for that dream job is okay. Especially if, you're, if you don't have to go back to school to do it, you basically are getting paid to get new skills that will get you your dream job. That's a win. That's a win. And so I think that is going to be helpful for some people because I get it. When you hear about your dream job or you meet somebody who has your dream job, like that's all you want, you definitely should apply for it and see if you can get it. But if you can't get it, it's okay, right? Look at people on LinkedIn. See, okay, this person has my dream job. What was the job that they had before this? Oh, okay. Why don't I go apply and get that job? Because clearly that job leads to this job. And I think that is going to be something that's super, super helpful. That's something I try to teach people. But to your point, Ron, it is so hard to convince them to give up their dream and you're not giving it up. You're just listening to the market. You're just setting yourself up for success so that you can ultimately get that get that dream job. You, you're giving them practical tools rather than it's not it's not an all or nothing thing. It's steps. Yeah, but you be you be honest, Ron. I mean, like you'd be surprised how many people are like do believe and treat it like it's all or nothing, right? Because they're like, Corey, that is the only job I want. Like, I'm not quitting this job to go get another job that's not that job. Corey, I'm not going to take a pay cut. Are you crazy? You want me to take a pay cut just so I could get some experience so then I can get my job? No, I'm not taking a pay cut, Corey. That's that's crazy. Why would I take why would I make less money? I hear that one all the time. All the time. I'm I'm sure you do. <laughs> They're like, Corey, I'm only quitting if I get to be, you know, the director of customer success. And I'm like, you have zero sales experience. Like, let's be real. Let's take a step back. The odds of you getting that job less than 1%. Yeah, but Corey, you're saying I have to take a pay cut to go get that job. 
in three years. No, thank you. Okay, then stay. Keep your mm. job. No problems. Just don't complain to me that you hate your job and that you don't like going to work anymore and that you're not motivated. Hey, Corey, one of the things that I like about this is that I like hearing your strategies, really good strategies. Mm -hmm. And um, and the other thing I like is that I feel like uh, your style and your presentation is very energizing. To me, it 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 makes me want to do more um, to take that next step. So I appreciate that. I just wanted to let you know that that's one of the ways that I, one of the things that I use when I go to things like this is that, you know, I try to um, sometimes feel like I need to move and not be so complacent about things, but um, it helps. It helps. The discussion helps and everything. So I appreciate you and Ron for that. That's very helpful to me. And, and I appreciate the comment because you've created a template for people to get feedback and they could either listen or not. And most people kind of just deny what they hear. They just quietly move on and go to the next, apply for the next job and not listen. Mm -hmm. Any final questions? Well, you, you've been very generous with your time. I know we had a small crowd today, but I'm, uh, I would have, have liked to have seen more people here because I think a lot more people could have taken advantage of your psychology and your strategy, uh, Corey. I really do. Um, so, but that they're the ones that are missing out. So, I really appreciate it, Corey, and thanks for sharing your time.